however you are and whenever you are. Welcome, good souls of the planet and beyond the paranormal. Now, I'm Alan B. Smith. Join us as we traverse the cosmic highway of paranormal portals and tantalizing turnoffs. And uh, yeah, we had some tantalizing turnoffs tonight, to be sure. Um, we're having some issues with uh, getting James Fox on tonight. I am so sorry to let all of you down um, who are waiting to hear from James. Um, we'll keep you posted um, as the night goes on to see if we can get James um, hooked up and connected tonight, which means you have the absolute pleasure of hanging out with Bill Skywatcher, our producer, and myself tonight. And uh, Bill and I, we're just going to do an hour and we're going to chat and uh, we'll take questions from y'all if you want, you know, um, you know, let us know what you think about these topics that we discuss every week. Um, if you have any questions for us and our opinions, um, if you want to talk about the Thanksgiving holiday, that's great too. And happy past Thanksgiving to everybody. Um, I hope it was a, a good one, a safe one, and uh, you got a chance to zoom in like I did with uh, loved ones. So Bill, what's going on? Nothing much. How was Thanksgiving? It was good. It was cool. I was telling you earlier, so we, we zoomed in, we had our computer set up in the kitchen so that it would face the table and um, the love of my life made this beautiful spread. Um, I contributed an apple pie and then my family was zooming in from that, their kitchen table and we just ate Thanksgiving like that together. Nice. Yeah. So, uh, Bill, did you see the phenomena? Uh, actually, I have to be honest, I haven't yet. You didn't. Okay. Well, it was really, really good. I, I watched it twice. Um, and, I, and I see a couple of comments in here as well that I think, um, uh, who, who was it? Who, who purchased the film? It was Bobby. Bobby purchased the film, I think. Um, or was it Andy? I'm sorry, guys, I can't remember. Um, but one of you guys just, just watched it as well. I, I think that my takeaway of the phenomena was... It basically introduced the, the entire UFO enigma to new audiences, but reframed it in a way that gave it more weight. Um, and I think really kind of nailed it as far as legitimizing this phenomena, the UFO enigma, whether it's UFOs visiting nuclear facilities, specific cases, um that took place in, in particular the um socorro new mexico case is definitely i still think one of the most um convincing cases outside of roswell that you know that it, it makes it very difficult to argue that yeah aliens did or did not visit here yeah i think i think they did um now ken sherry last week he he does think that that there, these some of these beings are of earth beings what do you think bill well, first of all, I did have a lot of inside information before the film was even released, mm -hmm. being involved with some of the people that were involved with the film itself. So even though I haven't seen it, I am well versed on the topics that were discussed and the cases, um, the background of the film itself, especially mm -hmm. with Lee, uh, Lee Spiegel's involvement. But see, I'm torn, Alan, because I am not one to jump, you know, and just, just say that it's one source or another. I'm sure a lot of people are having um, experiences, but again, when you, for myself, like I was going to show you right here because I just got my new toy in Allen and I'm going to show you here this. Right oh here. yeah. Hold on. Let's, let's hold on. I got, this is the new Sony a seven S three. Yes. And this is what I'll be using as well as my older camera for sky watching. But now, you can also use that for streaming too. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. That's what it's going to be for. Well, like, for example, the Geminids Media Shower is coming up December 13th. Mm -hmm. um, and that is going to be an amazing uh, media shower for anyone who's interested because it's going to be 120 per hour. The moon will not be an issue this year. So if you're in an area that's dark sky, if, it, you, if you're in a city, you're going to have light pollution. So you need to get away from that light environment and going to a darker area. This year is going to be phenomenal um, if the weather is clear, if it cooperates. Sure. But you, go ahead. What, what date is that? December 13th, a Sunday night. So the morning of the 14th is really the peak. But when you mention about um, people, you know, they, they had, they witnessed things. I would say, Alan, and I said this on a previous show, I, I would say 99% is explainable. It's as simple as that whether it's a natural, uh, natural phenomenon, um, 
man-made. I mean, there there is an explanation. The likelihood is there is a logical explanation. Right. But yeah. even like in my case, in 2014, I picked up something on the camera that I have no answer for. I don't know what it is. I am not saying it's extraterrestrial in nature. All I'm saying is I don't know what it was. Um, due to the movement and what it, it actually did, you know, mm -hmm. I eliminated a lot of the possibilities. Now, I respect a lot of the people that gave me their opinions, and they were they differed. Mm -hmm. Not everybody had the same conclusion. But that tells me also that they didn't really know what it was because the problem is when you have an object that's way up, and this is the problem, forget about a cell phone. I discount many cell phone footages anyway because when people move it around and they don't have a steady hand, it makes sure. it appear. Then you have camera uh, anomalies like flares. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a person that knows what they're looking at can pretty much take something and discount it. Um, but now as far as the source, like you're saying, whether it's otherworldly, interdimensional, parallel, that's the big question, Alan. I, yeah. you know, that, I think that's where, you know, everybody's like, what's going on? Kind of. Yeah. Thing. Well, it's interesting in the 1950s and 60s, and this was covered in the, the Phenomena film, uh, you know, there were these, you know, sort of flocks of, of UFOs that were sighted. And we don't see that so much anymore. It seemed to be many more eyewitness accounts of that occurring. And I think that's because they, they, they must know, you know, what technology we have, right? So, you know, whether you're flying over, you know, a ranch in the middle of Minnesota, um, or the White House in 1952, they know there's not a bunch of people with cameras that are going to be able to, you know, have quick reflex, point and shoot, and get a good shot on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it seems to me that as time goes on, less and less of those closer encountered sightings, um, you know, uh, you know, flocks of, of flying saucers going through the air, they're just not they're just not occurring because they know we have a much better chance of catching them on camera. But it's also, do you think that they actually uh, can be seen through maybe the spectrums that we use? Maybe they can't. Maybe it's something that we can identify just by a simple camera. Maybe, so a, te a technology. Right. Maybe you need uh, some other type of technology to detect um, their location and to actually visualize and see them on some type of technical technical platform you know it may not be simply just by looking up and you see them it can mm -hmm. be only on a different like i said a different spectrum of light so what we see is one thing that's very narrow to mm -hmm. the full spectrum um yeah but if you if we if for instance if i can see something with my eyes let's say i'm using you know an older film camera right and so there there's no digital processing i'm, I'm just shooting pointing clicking then if I can see it with my eye, then shouldn't the, the film capture it as well? Well, I would, I would assume so. But like if you're looking at heat signature, infrared, even X-ray, gamma, I mean, there's a lot of things our eyes cannot see. Like right now, there can, there can be something in, around you in your space that your eyes cannot see, but other equipment can. It's the, it depends on what it's trying to detect. All right, and I just want to let everybody know who's joining in a few minutes late. Um, we're having some issues with G getting James Fox on, so he may not be joining us uh, tonight. So I'm, again, I'm sorry to let anybody down who's excited. Um, if James isn't able to to jump on tonight, then we'll we'll try to reschedule for another another day. Um, of all of all the documentaries that you have seen, Bill, uh, is there anything in particular or any shows that you like the wow. best that covers this topic? Wow, that's <laughs> be, well. I think you and I. Wow, that's a tough one out because there's so many out there. Mm -hmm. It's hard to even remember yeah. them. I, I'm being that I met Travis Walton, and I'm you know I, I know I know the man, and I, I, I if if there's one person, Alan, Travis, hundred percent in my book. Yeah, be, I, and he's personally he stayed over my home. Mm -hmm. I, I got to have a lengthy discussion with him and the people that were here also. I would say the Travis documentary that Jennifer Stein did because 
because of everything that was involved with that documentary and the mm -hmm. one that's going to be coming out soon. Um, and to me, based on the individuals that were involved that I know personally um, or work with them, like Mike Rogers, I have to say the Travis case has me, I mean, that's the one for me. Right. There's on, this... Because of my exchange and, and, you know, knowing the individuals involved. Right. And you spent some time with Travis and um, I've met him briefly in person, though, you know, I, I would claim to say I have a, a relationship of any kind, um, but he's been on the show a couple of times as well, as, including Jennifer Stein. And yeah, it's one of those cases that it, it really is about the credibility of the eyewitnesses because there, there's not much in the way of physical trace evidence. Right. So you have two different kinds of cases. You have the physical trace case and then you have an eyewitness case. And the, the eyewitness is the most difficult. Right. Because how do you how do you, um, you know, give credit to just someone's word? Um, but in this case, the, the Travis Walton case, you have multiple eyewitnesses. And over the years, none of them have have wavered. Um, and Mike Rogers, obviously, you know, having been on KGRA, you know, he's talked about this multiple times as well. And, you know, these are different personalities too, you know, and, and these aren't people who are nece necessarily, you know, in some, you know, private club and they're, they're ha having drinks and laughing about this hoax, you know, decades later, they're living separate lives. They're doing their own thing. Um, and they have no reason it seems to, to lie about this. And, and you have the lie detectors, of course. Um, they've passed those tests uh, most of the time with flying colors. The thing but, I would say, though, Alan, if you if you were to take all the testimony of all the different, let's call it credible eyewitnesses mm -hmm. that were involved in, say, the military, pilots, um, police officers, and I'm not saying that their credibility is more than another person's, but because of their stature and, and their involvement um, in military or, like I said, law enforcement, when I when I engage with somebody, and, and I couldn't believe it, Alan, I met somebody while I was in Sears mm -hmm. getting an oil change. And I had my KGRA uh, shirt on. And he says, oh, you're into that? And I said, yeah. Well, I have a story for you. I was like, okay, tell me. He's a retired New York State Parks Department police officer. Mm -hmm. So he would be the one that goes in the parks and, and patrols them, make sure everything's okay. So he told me he was on the Taconic Parkway and he was heading south. It was at night. Um, he was in his patrol car. And all of a sudden, he's seen a huge object the size of a football field. This is what he's telling me. Mm -hmm over his vehicle. So he steps out, he's looking at this thing right over his car. All of a sudden, and he hears a lot of chatter on the radio. This was in the 80s, by the way, at the height of the Hudson Valley uh, sightings. So all of a sudden, he sees coming from the north down the Taconic, a, uh, a bunch of patrol cars, police uh, vehicles, racing, chasing this, this object. They were actually pursuing it. And then it just shoots to the south. And they continue their chase. It's almost like out of the movie Close Encounters when you see the police cars chasing the UFO. Yeah, exactly. You know, and when I hear a story, and then I ask him, well, why why didn't you know this come out with uh, more evidence, like the more eyewitness testimony? And here's the key, and I think this is the key for a lot of people, because I've heard this in, with so many different people, whether they're pilots, law mm -hmm. enforcement, et cetera. First of all, if they make an official report, the first thing they do is put a psych eval in for them. They'll actually have them checked out to see if they're a right frame of mind. Secondly, he told me personally, oh, did I get it from all the other officers, the banter? You know, it was made a big joke. You know, he's talking about UFOs. Or now he's seeing UFOs. Mm -hmm. But really, it's because they don't want to make that report. That's the bottom line. They don't want to make it. They don't want to make an official report on whatever they experience. I spoke to a pilot. Um, I think he he's retired now. He told me there's no way I'm going to make a report out because he feels like, uh, first of all, they will send him for again a psyche valve. 
He's worried about losing his pension, losing his job. That's his livelihood. He's not going to jeopardize that. So you can imagine how many mm -hmm. people in all different walks of life, they're worried about you know, their own personal, uh, how this will affect them personally. Right. But at the same time, I spoke to the local lieutenant here that has now retired, and I asked them off the record, have the officers seen UFOs? And he says, Bill, off the record, the retired officers, he didn't say current, he said the, mm -hmm. did see stuff here in the Hudson Valley, even in one case, an object going into the Hudson River and out. So what, what are you supposed to, you know what I mean? This is, he's telling me off the record, a lieutenant, and he's telling me this stuff. And you hear this all the time, Alan. Yeah, oh, it's been going around for, for decades. I remember, I think it was a Popular Mechanics magazine article in the 90s that I was reading about a uh, the Hudson Valley a UFO event. Um, and, I, and I remember reading, I don't know if this is the same article, that there were some caves, and I can't remember the exact location. Um, but growing up in New Jersey, I kind of thought, oh, you know, one day I'll get there. Um, a caves where these these UFOs would seem to kind of disappear into, um, which means they must be tiny craft um, to be able to do that. Or, you know, there's that whole interdimensional theory as well. Um, you know, are there vortex? Are there portholes? You know, I don't know. I think that that's the most difficult aspect of this phenomena. But like like in, in the phenomenon, the documentary, um, William Coleman, um, U.S. Air Force in Miami in 1955, and he eventually became a spokesman for Project Blue Book, had uh, an eyewitness event. And, um, you know, these, these are credible pilots. And when they see something and they say the craft doesn't have wings, um, when they say that there's a sh they, they know to look for the shadow, right, to confirm that, yes, indeed, this is a, a, a cylindrical shape or it's a disc-like shape. You know, when they're looking at the angle of the sun, they're checking their... You know, their covers, making sure it's not a refraction of light. They know they have a checklist in their head of what to go through to make that decision um, and assert, okay, this is an, a strange enigma that is unexplainable. And then on top of that, they see this craft take off. You know, and if so, if you're flying a plane at 300 miles per hour and, you know, top speed at the time, and you are you know, catching this thing, and then it just flicks away within a near split of a second. It's inconceivable for me that th this could be explained in any other way other than an off-world off craft. But um, because, well, I was just thinking, I'll say this, we, the Soviet Union, right, when, when it fell, you know, because some people think, oh, maybe some of this craft was Soviet craft, right? It seems to me the Soviets wanted to hang on to power as best as they could. And if they indeed have had such advanced technology at, at the last desperate attempt to hang on to their power, I think they would have employed it, but they didn't. So to me, that, that signals that, in fact, they didn't, that wasn't their technology, unless they have an even longer game. Um, there has to be a longer game, Alan. That's like but, saying right now, you don't think that we mm -hmm. have technology sitting somewhere that's so advanced and it's not been made aware to the public. Obviously, they're developing stuff all the time, um, top secret projects, but we don't see it until we see some form of it when it becomes public. Like they just tested off the F-35As. Uh, I think it was a supersonic um, nuclear weapon being fired from the plane and it's moving at Mach and they're firing this missile. That's what we're able to see. What, what Can you imagine what they do have that we don't know? So when I think of the Tic Tac, personally, there is not, no way in my book that Tic Tac is a UFO. That's just my opinion now. Because I've spoken to different people, scientists, mm -hmm. and when I hear what they tell me, I'm saying, okay, this technology is something, some propulsion. I have documents that were sent to me it was in uh remember the whole wilson papers and that whole thing the came wilson out? davis yeah yeah okay. shortly thereafter mm -hmm. i have papers i think they're documented i think the date is 2011 mm -hmm. might be earlier oh you're getting uh, yeah hold on one sec i'm gonna let yeah. you take over for for a moment there okay, Bill. yeah 
So the, the government, our government, was already uh, contacting contractors to look into futuristic platforms, a, a threat assessment, uh, let's call it, uh, on technology, advanced technologies, propulsion, et cetera. This was in 2011 or prior. I have the documents actually on my computer, but I'm not going to share them because I'm not going to get in trouble. But they were already, they knew that this technology was being worked on. Now, again, I'm not discounting paranormal activity, UFOs, et cetera. All right, update. Yeah. James is coming on in uh, in about 10 minutes. He had some issues with connection, cell phone. I'm sure he'll tell the story when he gets on the air. But just everybody know James Fox is joining cool. us. But okay. Just continuing this, yeah. the tick time. Now, let's think about this in another way. Um, I'm just going to go based on some, like I said, some of the things that I was told. We know the patents that the Navy put in. We know that they're developing. I, without giving out too much information, I was told by a scientist that what was a Russian scientist has been working on uh, magnetic propulsion for decades, okay? Mm -hmm. I think it was last year, he was in Finland, and he was been working on this for decades, Alan. They sent in, Moscow sent in folks to scoop him up, bring him back to Moscow, and take all his work. All of it. Yeah. They just took everything. Now... I believe that what we're dealing with is a drone. Let's mm -hmm. say there's an object. It's emitting a field around that. And you can look it up. Um, you've had Mark Antonio on Alcubierre uh, Drive sure. to create a bubble. Let's think about that now. Yeah. You have something creating a bubble. It's going to be seamless. It's going to appear as seamless. It may even take the form visually of a Tic Tac. And this thing, Good point. It, mm -hmm. they're testing some type of propulsion. And what a better place to do it is on um, a military exercise. And this, remember, this is going back into the early 2000s with that whole Nimitz thing. Um, what a better way to test it on a platform when they know they're not armed. It's non-lethal. It's just a drill. You know, they don't have, they're not, they don't have any kind of armaments on any of the equipment on, this, on the planes or the system. It's just... So what better way than to test it and see their reaction and see what this thing can do? So I okay, believe now, now, now I'm confused. Maybe maybe you know, maybe uh, the listeners in the comment section will know as well. So uh, other than the locking on of radar with, let's say, the Tic Tac UFO, right? Um, was there a visual well, didn't confirmation the pilot, with, with the eyes? Well, didn't the pilot say? Um, That's it, Didn't Fraser or the female pilot Yes. A couple of people, didn't they say they actually made a That's what I thought, but but now I'm 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 questioning myself. So maybe Well, re well again, what I'm saying is going based on the Tic Tac. I I truly believe it could just be some type of a drone that's emitting a field around it and it appears to look like a Tic Tac and this thing can move at incredible speeds and angles and it, it defies logic when because if somebody's looking at this saying Wow, that must be a UFO. Now, I'm not trying to be a debunker because you know me. I'm all for this whole air field. I wouldn't be doing what I do. But I, if I, I've had experiences, Alan. I've had two sightings. I've got something on video. I believe. I believe. I do believe. But I need evidence. You, you need evidence. We all need evidence. That's where we're, we're all looking. For. We're all looking for that tangible evidence. Is it, is it faith? Or do you do you no, do you no, I don't fully it, do you fully I, accept? I think based on all the credibility behind witness testimony, whether it's folks on nuclear bases, pilots, like I said, speaking to police officers, they're witnessing something. Something is going on. But what exactly it is, I'm not sure. Now well, hence, hence the enigma, right? But 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 there's definitely something going on. It's so difficult because I think we look at things in a naive way when it comes to, like, we're a type zero civilization. To think that there's not another civilization out there that doesn't have the capacity 
to travel vast distances and things that we cannot comprehend yeah. at our level right now. Just because we can't do it does not mean an advanced civilization out there doesn't have the capacity to do so. Correct. Now, but if you look at it, just think of it if you zoomed out uh, away from Earth mm -hmm. and you were looking from it from a vast distance, light years away. Just think of the chances of picking our planet. It's like a grain of sand in the whole uh, universe. I mean, we're such a small little speck. To to stumble upon us would be an incredible feat in itself. If an advanced civilization actually found us, maybe they have the technology to detect, like we're mm -hmm. trying to do. We're looking at exoplanets. We're trying to put up the Webb telescope and other uh, means to see if we can detect life on other planets or other galaxies, etc. The same way we're trying, I'm sure maybe they have too. But this is like really complex. I truly believe there is life out there somewhere. The, the law of averages would say so, Alan. There's, the number is off the scale when you think about how many galaxies and within that billions and billions of planets and stars and moons. Sure. Like right here in our solar system, we have the potential for life. Well, Just there's the solar system. Sure. We, we've, we've detected biological signatures um or potential biological signatures on moons and on mars as well within exactly. our within our solar system exactly. and it's, it's really i think it's just a matter of time before we confirm you know bacteria um, bacteria is growing somewhere and then once that's officially confirmed then there's no holds bar right i mean that's if, no if, if they just, got, they're gonna find it yeah i mean just statistically if in our solar system life exists on one two or three different bodies then you know in the solar system it's it's everywhere i would say in the universe I, sorry i would if i had uh, i mean europa to me is probably the one i'm so curious about um that because same thing that exists here on earth so uh, there's an ice sheet and there is supposedly an ocean on Europa, if you can penetrate that. Exactly. Height, you yeah. get to it. I think right. it's about a mile thick, they said, or it was right. one kilometer. I can't remember. Think of it similar to Earth. We have the, the vents, the volcanic vents in the oceans. In between that extreme cold water and that vent of that extreme heat, there's, again, let's call it a Goldilocks area, where in that little space, you can have some type of activity of life. Yes, it can be microscopic but there's a possibility there's in that band there is life yeah because it, it's in that temperature range and then the whole thing is what it does life um because you there is life that is that, uh, that exists in really extreme in conditions so do we have to see life as what we see it as ourselves carbon or is it going to be some other type of form of life that we have you know what I mean? It's yeah, complicated. I would I would imagine though in our in our solar system, in all likelihood it would be carbon based, um, right. just because knowing how the solar system is formed, you know, there's this constant collision and exchanging of material and matters. So, I think the odds are yeah, it'll be carbon based. But you're right, maybe in some far flung, you know, part of the galaxy or some other galaxy far away, in a galaxy far far away, uh, you know, there's a Wookiee out there, right? Or that's that's like a nitrogen based or something. I, you know, I don't know. I like I said, I, I, I based on everything that's going on with all the witness testimony, mm -hmm. I think there needs to be at least some type of a hearing, some type of a congressional hearing and, and present witness testimony. Let's let's hear it, because in a court of law, you probably could can get get convicted on less. Well, I can think we're getting that? there. We're well, getting there, but I, they really need to put and you're going to hear more of it because now I'll throw this to you. I'm going to be devil's advocate here. A lot of people will say, well, are they using this threat assessment, mm -hmm. UFOs? To me, it's the threat that our adversary would have um, against us. Uh, you know, I'm not going to just run off all the nations, but there is a, a, a legitimate risk threat to our country from other countries. Now, if you start throwing the UFO equation in there, it makes mm -hmm. it nice. It makes it sound nice. But to me, it's always about one thing, money, funding. We need to start 
do you know you know what i mean that's oh, absolutely it's a justification exactly. i think and and that's why it seems like once the um department of defense confirmed that yes the videos released by a tip um are real and they are um unidentified aerial phenomena then after that they started using language like threat and it continually was repeated the word threat 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 and i think you're right because it you know if you're the pentagon um the more reason you have to get funding from congress the better and so maybe finally um you know someone was like you know instead of you know being so shy about this maybe we can use this to our advantage and and get more funding and maybe some of that funding goes to more black budget projects maybe it goes to special access programs that's totally possible the one thing though alan i think i don't know what your opinion is just the weaponization of space is not where we want to go it's bad enough here on oh, our I agree. planet. Yeah. You cannot take this now outward and expand on the militarization of space, et cetera, because you know, it's just going to turn into a whole different level if we do that. But it's, we're, we're in a, if you think about it this way, if you were an advanced species, mm -hmm. would you want to interact with what they see, how we behave down here? They, what, what do you think would happen? And this makes, this just humors me. Let's say a UFO comes into our airspace. Mm -hmm. What are we supposed to do? Communicate with it? Fire a warning shot? Like they're supposed to understand you're entering uh, airspace, do not advance, and then we're trying to communicate that to them, and they keep on moving toward our space. And then what are you going to do? Fire a warning shot at it? What are you going to do? Yeah. So we're going to make the first move, that move against something that is an unknown? that's not a good thing and you don't do you do you know what i mean that's i do i do and i for the, for the longest time i always thought you know it's absolutely absurd that they would um oh you know hold on bill i want to see if i can oh, get james are? on here all right so i will say good night to everybody i hope everybody had a great holiday um enjoy the rest of the show and alan should be back shortly hopefully we still have 25 minutes and maybe we were we were going to do an hour show with James, but now maybe we'll be able to stretch the show for two hours as it normally is. And uh, James can come on and we'll extend the show and normalize it a bit. But I hope everybody had a great holiday. Um, and like I said, this is a complicated, it, it's, I am not the person to disrespect those. I can, I'm not going to judge others when they tell me what they've been through because I've seen stuff. I would be a hypocrite if I was to say to someone, well, your story's, you know, way out there. Who's to say? Who's to say anybody is cases? It, because it sounds way out there, but maybe they did have a truly, they truly had that experience. I've had lucid dreams. I've had things happen in my house. I've seen things, and I don't know what the heck is going on. But if somebody tells me something when I go to Pine Bush for the fair, and they tell me their story, I have to respect that. I can't judge them. They and they truly had an experience. And sometimes it's it's to the point where it's uh traumatic. So what you know, you have to be careful. And I'm not going to offend somebody, you know, based on that. And there's a lot of people out there that claim to have experiences. A lot of people. Now, it could be something else and it could have a rational explanation to it. But um at the same time, it, it truly could be something going on. Uh, who again? Who am I um, to to judge? I, and I would never do that. But at the same time, what's what's going on around us? I, if anything, we need to look at our oceans more carefully. If anywhere is going to be a great hiding spot, it would be right here in our oceans, where we can't get to the depths due to the pressure. If they're probably, if they're here, if, they're probably right here in plain sight, but we just can't get there. That would make the most logical conclusion to me because how much of, the, of our oceans are truly discovered? And have we actually researched? Now, with the more technology that we get into, but if anything, how many times you've heard of under, underwater bases like Puerto Rico and other places around the world? You hear that all the time. And I'm not going to discount that. But for me, and I think a lot of people that are watching here, 
we want that evidence, don't we? We want to see the game changer. The thing is, if just like everything else, let's let's just to, to I'm just going to make the assumption that they have known about this for decades. And then they come out with it. They've lied to us for decades. What do you think that does? Think of the state of what's going on now with the lack of trust. If they were to come out, it's not going to be easy for them to say, well, we've known all along because then people, if you have mistrust now, it's forget about it. That's Pandora's box, a can of worms opening. It's impossible to navigate because everything else is going to be questioned. So this is this is a dicey situation. It's also under the, the guise of national security. How much does how much can you say? Because the other countries want to know too. They don't want to reveal if they have certain technologies. They're not about to let that out. They want to keep that for themselves and use it to advance their own. But what is it used for mostly? Is it used for the application of science and for the good of humanity? Or is it being used for military applications? If if it's going on. This is like, is it's really complicated. This is multi-layered when you look at it, at the possibilities, like to the Stars Academy. And I hear this all the time. What is their end game? Is it so that they can get military contracts, money, funding for some of the things that they want to do? I mean, what is their agenda in all this? to put up information to the public, to make them aware that this is going on. You, I look at it at two ways. The, to be fair and objective, what, what is their agenda? And you hear people, I'm sure all of you that are watching right now probably think the same way. If you have, you have to be open-minded, but you have to look at things with a balanced uh, a view. You can't, it's like I said, it's difficult. I wish I could show you because Alan brought me on suddenly because we were waiting for James Fox to come on. I wish I can show you some of the footage, well, the one footage that I got over my house of something curving down, coming back up, stops. And for a sp split second, it stops and then goes right back out to space. Has a big light in the, and that's not a light. I'm just going to say it has a big light and two smaller ones in the back. It's shaped like a triangle, but it's not light. It's propulsion because it brightens up before, just before it goes, it takes off. Hey, Bill, um, we're going to have to go to a quick break. I'm going to need your help. We'll get James Fox on here. So everybody have a great night. Um, I went off on a little rant and I apologize if I did, but enjoy the rest of the show and we'll be back, I guess. All right. Stand by, everyone. We'll be back after this first break with hopefully James Fox. We'll get this tech stuff worked out in just a moment. This is Alan B. Smith for Power Normal Now on KGRA Radio. We'll see you on the flip side. On and on and again The signs keep on coming They point to the end But I hold on so tight Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Are you still at it? Yeah, I need more speed. This baby's fast. My dad's fast. He's scary fast. You really think you could beat him? Yep, yeah, because I drink more tea than he does. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, pal, it's the tea that makes you go. Oh. Hey, Dad. You know, kiddo, you have to drink a lot more tea to be faster than me. Drink the tea that makes you go. Life change tea. You may not need as much as Dad. You never know. GetTheTea.com. Log on to GetTheTea.com. 
In 2019, the KGRA is closing down its archive vault to be reopened in another format in the near future. This year, you can get all the 2019 KGRA programming on demand on YouTube, Spreaker, iTunes, Spotify, iHeart, and Google Play. More ways for you to stay connected to your contact for Alternative Talk Radio on the planet, KGRARadio.com. Mainstream media's most wanted. KGRARadio.com. Lost in a bad way, I've got to let you go. Paranormal Talk Radio, you'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Are you still at it? Yeah, I need more speed. This baby's fast. My dad's fast. He's scary fast. You really think you could beat him? Yep, yeah, because I drink more tea than he does. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, pal, it's the tea that makes you go. Oh. Hey, Dad. You know, kiddo? You have to drink a lot more tea to be faster than me. Drink the tea that makes you go. Life change tea. You may not need as much as Dad. You never know. GetTheTea.com. Log on to GetTheTea.com. In 2019, the KGRA is closing down its archive vault to be reopened in another format in the near future. This year, you can get all the 2019 KGRA programming on demand on YouTube, Spreaker, iTunes, Spotify, iHeart, and Google Play. More ways for you to stay connected to your contact for Alternative Talk Radio on the planet, KGRARadio.com. Mainstream media's most wanted. KGRARadio.com. Not try to capture our feel and tell you the whole truth, but there's so much to be said, so I just leave you smoke cruise, but now I'm burying my soul, and the soul of soul. Welcome back to Paranormal Now. This is Alan B. Smith, your grateful host. Um, yes, it is one of those nights. James Fox is still on standby. We're working on the tech issues, and we will uh, get him on, whether by video and or audio at some point. Um, and we'll be discussing his film, The Phenomena. And uh, yeah, it was a really good documentary. Now, I have heard some people say that it's just a rehash of old cases, and I, I have to disagree because it's about how you frame those cases um, and how you shine a light on them in, in such a way that helps to legitimize them. And he does that very well in the documentary. So I do appreciate that. And there are also a couple of new cases, um, for me at least, the 1966 um, Australian visitation case where uh, these adults now have were children 
when they saw a UFO um, have come forward and are sharing that on the record. And I think that helps further legitimize their experience because you, when you have years and years to talk about it, to share your experiences, to question yourself, do you know, like, did I really experience that? Is that, is that what I think it was? Um, that helps you formulate um, a belief in yourself and a belief in the experience. And when you have others who have that shared experience and they can confirm that what happened to them uh, was the same that happened to you, then you can feel much more confident about that as an adult. And also the stigma has dropped. So now I think it's, and this is exactly why I think we see those in the military, in public service, in government, speaking more openly about this, is that they feel that there is a legitimacy to this and that they can talk about these subjects openly. And that is what's going to lead us to disclosure. That's my belief that, that I don't think what we're seeing towards disclosure right now has anything to do with, you know, the powers that be behind the scenes. Um, I think it's happening on its own. I think younger generations who are now in their thirties, forties, and are in public office, they're coming from a generation where they grew up on the X-Files, on Steven Spielberg films. They, they've seen all the coverage of all the work, um, you know, by Kevin D. Randall, Stanton Friedman, uh, Donald Schmidt, and all those documentaries, all those books, you know, John Mack, all of, they have decades of work that has helped to make this a legitimate subject of study. And now that those people who grew up with that, read those books, watch those programs, are in office, they can now say, do you know what? I don't, I don't have to go with the, the old tribe, right? We're the new tribe. We, we're, we have a new outlook on this whole phenomena and we're not afraid. And um, it reminds me too of, we were on the James Gill and uh, ranch some years ago. Uh, and there was a gentleman there who was telling us that he had been on the ranch before um, and that he had seen these UFOs visit and come close. So we're there, it's a beautiful night, clear sky, and there's this light that we see off in the distance. And now he, he has those laser pointers, right? And as it starts to come close, he's, he's pointing this laser and he's saying, hey, guys hey buddies you know um there was this sense of I, I know who these people are um they're coming back i've met them before and as he's you know putting the pointer out there he thinks that it's attracting them and it's coming closer and it's coming closer and so we're starting to get that weird feeling like oh my god is this is this real are we gonna have contact with you know if not contact close encounter eyewitness incident with extraterrestrials with a ufo and then as it gets closer and closer and closer you start to see the light kind of tilt and then you see the spotlight and then you begin to realize it's just a helicopter but this man's willingness and faith in believing in the hope wanting to believe that in fact it is a UFO of extraterrestrials whom he claims to have um, had close encounter with before. That says two things. One, he's much more comfortable, like so many of us, our generations are. But two, I think that's in fact, the only concern that we could have is that if the government does confirm that we are visited by extraterrestrials, that these UFOs are from off planet, I think it is somewhat of a legit fear that there would be this cult of the alien. Cause we, we see that now there are those who, um, just choose to believe because they want to, cause it gives them a sense of meaning. Um, it becomes a religious kind of experience. And so if we confirm that, yes, we're being visited by aliens, but we know nothing about them, that leaves the imagination wide open for many, many people, um, who want to believe in something. And if they don't know where these beings are from, what they're doing, 
then they can simply decide and project onto them what they want to believe. And you might have an explosion of UFO cults. I'm not saying that's true, but I can understand that that would be um, a legit concern. And finally, everyone, the moment you have been waiting for all night long, I bring to you James Fox. Hello, sir. How are you? Welcome to Paranormal Now. Thank you. I'm sorry about the uh, technical difficulties. And uh, this is the first time I've been in my office in about two and a half months. So excuse the clutter behind me. No worries. Um, now, did, but, did I mess yeah. something up on, on my end? Did you and Bill figure it out? Well, does it, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. What, was, it, was, it my, <laughs> was it my fault? Because <laughs> that's fine. You can tell me. <laughs> no, no. We, well, we actually had to go a different route. So okay. um, All right. we had to bypass that system altogether. All right. Well, very good. Well, welcome again for coming out to the show. And everyone who's um, just joining in, this is James Fox. He's the director of The Phenomena. Again, I highly recommend you see it. It's on Amazon.com. And uh, so, James, before we, we talk about the film itself, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved? I know your father uh, was a journalist. And in my own memory, the first documentary, which I believe was, was your first documentary in this uh, subject, was Out of the Blue. Uh, but beyond that, what, what would you like to share about yourself? Well, um, I'm six foot one. I have chocolate brown eyes. <laughs> touche. No, touche. I, it's the important you know things, James. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Things didn't really matter. I got great looking nails, joke. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I had a father who was a paraplegic and, and ultimately a quadriplegic with multiple sclerosis, mm -hmm. who was a rather prominent journalist. And uh, when I when I grew up, I uh, you know my dad was a very motivated, ambitious guy. He never let the fact that he was paralyzed kind of slow him down. And I became at a very young age the the chauffeur, the the secretary, the nurse, um, you know, co-writer, whatever you want to. Yeah, I mean, I was his right hand man. I mean, we traveled around the world together. We met with uh, Stephen Hawking, Gone Villain Keys in, in England. Um, cool. Yeah, and uh, race car legend uh, Dan Gurney. We did stuff for Sports Illustrated, Formula One races. We, we traveled around. We had a great time together. We worked hard, um, but very mainstream stuff. And I uh, I got interested in, in UFOs kind of by accident through a good friend of mine. And um, I didn't quite, I just didn't believe it initially. And he kept sort of uh, encouraging me to, I, I think I came to a couple of conferences and listened to some military guys. And I was particularly impressed with the military guys. Anyway, long story short, I, I decided uh, in my mid twenties that I was gonna do a documentary on, on the topic. And uh, I'd already been doing video production. I'd been doing PSAs, uh, public, service announcements for AIDS awareness. I did stuff, all just all kinds of uh, little videos. And I remember my dad's reaction. He, you know, he was always very supportive of me throughout you know, my whole like youth, uh, young life. And uh, he was like adamant, like, what are you doing, son? There's nothing to this. You're wasting your life. This is a dead end road. And, uh, and of course, me being the tourist I am, that was probably the, the incentive I needed to, I'm going to prove this guy wrong, you know? And yeah. um, uh, it was actually my first film was called UFOs, 50 Years of Denial, which I sold to Discovery uh -huh. Channel. It was broadcast on Learning Channel. And, uh, and I said back then in the 90s, I was never going to do another. It took me four years. <laughs> it was pretty intense. I, I didn't realize what I was getting myself into, you know, but I, I'm going to get it done. And, um, well, 2003 was out of the blue. Was that your first independent film separate from selling it to a studio? Because that, that was all you, wasn't it? All my films have been independent. I've never sold a okay. film up front ever. Oh, I mean, great. I've done TV shows where, you know, organized up ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's a whole other story. <laughs> but in terms of like my documentaries, no, I do them all on spec. Uh, I've been incredibly fortunate and I've, I've sold, I've managed to sell every one of them. Uh, even be the last, gosh, the last, all of them. I, I, in fact, all four of my documentaries were sold before they were finished. I mean, how lucky am I? Yeah. I mean, that was, and that, yeah. that's amazing, especially, you know, this is pre 
um, you know, if we discount the phenomena, you know, this is pre Amazon Prime, you know, oh, yeah. you, you don't have the digital reach that you have yeah. now. Yeah, you know, and funny, it's like 50 years of denial. It's a good, you know, it was my first doc, my first real doc that, you know, I sold and I did okay. And, and mm -hmm. uh, it got me invited to Russia and, and uh, sort of led me into the, my, my other film, Out of the Blue. But interestingly, I, I learned many lessons along my journey, um, particularly in, in production, you know, uh, how important B-roll is, <laughs> how important lighting and audio is, you know, um, and I sort of did a lot of it myself just because I couldn't afford to pay anybody else. Mm -hmm. So I did the camera, the interview, the editing, the lighting, the audio, <laughs> you know. I know your um, pain. <laughs> yeah, you know, and but... <laughs> But uh, but I learned a lot, and, and yeah. it really helped me know understand the, the the field better. And I think it makes me a better director now, because I a I've learned from my past mistakes. Yeah. But b I know how to do. Not that I'm excellent in any one capacity with any number of those, but I do them, and I think that helps make me a more well-rounded uh, director. Oh, absolutely. The the phenomena is certainly more evolved than out of the blue, as as powerful of a film that was, and it had enormous impact um you know just just from a aesthetic point of view you know it was it's very clean very polished and the way that you and i was speaking about this earlier the way that you frame older cases i think is extraordinarily important because some of the critique that i see online is oh well the phenomenon you know it's, it's just rehashing some older cases you know and until the end then we get some newer stuff but you know two things if you're new to this topic um every new documentary that covers the old cases is a good thing you know because that's a whole new generation of people that are learning and two if you are presenting it to those of us who are familiar from a slightly different angle um or you're telling it a little bit differently inevitably it causes all of us to think a little bit differently about a particular case like for instance you know over the years um you know, I've talked to Kevin Randall a few times. Uh, he's been on the show, and it surprises me that so many people are not that familiar with the Socorro case, which is, in fact, I think probably the best trace evidence case there is, hands down. How do you feel about that case? Oh my gosh! Look, I spent five years researching that case. I went to Socorro. I went so many times. I got to know people in the town. I got to know uh, Lonnie's wife, Mary, his daughter, oh. Diana, uh, his son, Michael, uh, his co-worker. I interviewed him. Unfortunately, he's passed since then. I, I interviewed him on camera. In fact, I interviewed almost all these people on camera. I didn't Amazing. interview yeah. Michael on camera. But um, And then I went to, everyone's like, well, you've got to go meet Ray Stanford. He wrote the book on it back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, Ray Stanford wrote that book. Um, I think he was at the landing site within a week with Dr. Hynek. Uh, he wrote the book, uh, Socorro Saucer in a Pentagon Pantry. And he even says, it wasn't a saucer that landed in Socorro, it was an egg-shaped object, but still, it yeah. just a play of words. He liked the title and that's the title. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so, and I went to the National Archives, I dug up doc documents, um, went to the landing site multiple times. I mean, yeah, that case is, it's the, by far and beyond a shadow of doubt, the most well-documented close encounter of the third kind in U.S. history. Right. And um, now I remember on sightings in the 90s, they showed footage. And outside of that, it it's very rare. I don't see that footage shown, but you show it in your in your documentary, the actual imprints of the, the craft. And this is the footage from, what was it, 66? 64. 64. 64. Um, and Lonnie Zamora there, you see the the um, military and police officers on site. So I can't think of any other landing case where we have video documentary of military and police personnel and, and journalists on site looking at actual evidence. It's really profound. And I, I encourage well, everybody to, to check this out. Yeah, so I... Uh... One of the aspects, and I'm sure your viewers know this, but uh, Dr. Jalen Hynek, who investigated UFOs in an official capacity for the United States Air Force from 47 to 69, mm -hmm. broke these cases up, classified them as close encounters of the first case. 
a witness reports a UFO, close encounter of a of the second, I'm sorry, close encounter of the second kind. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, somebody reports a UFO and the UFO interacts with the environment, whether it's burns on the face or marks on the ground or radar or uh, photographic. And then close encounter of the third kind when the witnesses report the beans. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the aspects that became really clear to me early on that the Air Force really wanted to uh, uh, sweep under the under, under the rug. And um, there were military uh, on the scene and even an FBI within less than an hour of Socorro. It was a Friday. It was April 24th, 1964. It was about 5 p.m. There were military on site from Holloman Air Force Base, White Sands, within, you know, less it was an hour or just under an hour. Mm -hmm. So um, they collected all kinds. Of, I mean, the, the bushes were still burning and there were imprints, not just from the landing gear, but there were footprints from the two beings that directly corresponded to the eyewitness testimony, who was an on-duty police officer, um, exactly where the beans, he, where he reported the beans, there were footprints from the beans uh, left at, at the ground traces. And I spoke with the son of the first military, actually the two sons of the first military officer who was on the scene, uh, Richard T. Holder. And according to them, he took plaster casts of the footprints, of the landing gear, uh, of all that stuff, um, detailed documents, diagrams and that was uh, again that was an aspect of the the encounter that they really wanted to damp down for obvious reasons it's, it's much easier to explain away a misidentified aircraft uh, it's another thing uh, up in the sky and it's another thing to, uh, when you've got beans on the ground you know what i mean and right, so and I think, yeah go ahead uh, what i was going to tell you is that uh, they really played that aspect of it down but there were reporters on the scene within before the military got there. Mm -hmm. So aspects of that encounter of the description of the beans leaked out to the press. And when I became friends with Mary Zamora, Lonnie's wife, uh, Lonnie's the witness, the police officer, she allowed me, it's a long story, but she allowed me to go through his archives for the first time ever in 50 years. I was the only one to ever do it. That's and I don't think his own family did it. And he had cutouts of the news of the local newspaper reports of the encounter with the beans all placed in, a, in an envelope inside his his um his black duffel bag which i went through and i scanned those and i featured some of those in the film and that's the description of the beans and um, and that sort of thing i think one of the interesting things when you're looking at it from a investigative or if you're a detective right um when you're analyzing a case, you, you, there's information that you don't want to reveal. Um, so that way, when you speak to an eyewitness, if they share that information, uh, you know, then you can confirm whether they're, they're telling the truth or just regurgitating something they heard in the media, right. Um, and in that same line of, of thinking, it's interesting to me that Lonnie Zamora described these tiny beings. And then when uh, investigators came to look at the site, the footprints were tiny. Yeah. You know, it's really fascinating that, that, yeah. that that's what they discovered independently. Yeah, they were, uh, in fact, I interviewed uh, Pablo Lopez, who's the dispatch officer's son, uh, who got to the site within minutes uh, of the encounter. And he describes, he was like, the footprints were as clear as day. I mean, they were right there in the sand. I mean, it was, it was super, and he described, and he went as far as, uh, drawing them with his finger, then putting a quarter down to give you a, an indication of how big they were. And they were, the footprints were, they were, they were tiny. I mean, they were like, you know, and they, and these, uh, and these beans were, were small. Uh, he thought they were children and they had tight, these uh, white suits on, uh, ju ju like jumpsuits, as he described. And, yeah, no. and while he got really close to the craft, I mean, he, he he saw the beans in the craft from a from a different angle from where he got out of the vehicle. He actually drove closer to it. Mm -hmm. He got within fifty feet of the object with his parked vehicle, and then he got out of the car and took about uh, three or four strides before the thing started to lift off. At which point, that freaked Lonnie out, and he ran behind right. the car for cover. So okay, so here's the interesting thing: when he arrived on the scene, he could not use his radio, if I'm correct. Um, That's correct. Yeah, and he didn't use it again until after the craft 
had left. Is that is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Okay. And yes, he felt the heat from the, the craft, so he was close enough. The one anomaly that I thought was really odd was that it had this kind of rocket fire mm. in its initial takeoff, right? Mm -hmm. um, a flame, some kind of combustion. And then it stops, and then it hovers. And I thought, okay, the only thing that could possibly be would be a dirigible, but it wouldn't make sense to use combustion underneath well, a, a dirigible. There's there's an aspect of, of the, so it was a blue flame mm -hmm. that came down from the object, and it made a loud sound. And the blue flame was not like a rocket flame. It, it mm -hmm. actually went into the ground like a knife through warm butter, and it didn't just stir up the rocks and dust like a flame would. Mm -hmm. It was just a solid blue flame that cut through the ground. And um, when it got to about 20 feet off the ground, the flame disappeared, and the, and the, and the object went completely silent. You could hear a pin right. drop. Yeah. And, it, and it hovered there about 20, 30 feet off the ground, and Lonnie just looked at it in awe. Like, what am I looking at? Yeah. And it slowly started moving off. I think it was the southwest towards a town called Magdalena. And mm -hmm. um, Lonnie actually said, I have an interview with Lonnie that was done on the radio that his family shared with me that uh, the first military, sorry, the first police officer showed up the scene because he was radioing as he was going to investigate whatever this thing was. But as he got closer, his radio went dead. But, but he did get their attention leading up to it. And the first officer, according to Lonnie, that got on the scene, saw the object as it was departing. But he never said anything because he didn't want to get in the middle of it all. I have to ask you this, even though it's not in your documentary. Are you a believer or a Gnostic of the Aztec UFO crash of 1948? I looked into that about 10 years ago. Um, but I'm the kind of person where I need to see firsthand credible eyewitness testimony like for instance one of the reasons why i'm i i find uh roswell case so compelling is that you've got the very people that were involved jesse marcel colonel debose mm -hmm. um you know and a handful of other people that they were very public initially with the uh, with the press uh release that they had recovered one of these things and then went on the you know did the photographic you know the press conference with posing next to the the fake debris mm -hmm. uh, and then later in life going actually on the record on camera um, saying that you know the initial press release was true and that the object was not of this earth so I need that kind of personally I'm not saying it did or didn't happen but I need that's the kind of confirmation that I need um, that uh, that I find very persuasive um, I have a question from Excalibur for full. Um, does anyone have a correct version of the symbol Zamora saw on the side of the egg craft? Yes, I, yes, that's a very good point. So there has been 50 years of uh, speculation and bickering about the, uh, the symbol. I, I, I can tell you with 100% certainty that the, uh, the symbol, the correct symbol, is an inverted V with two lines in the middle. So you've got like what looks like an A with two lines and then a line on top. And that was uh, Richard T. Holder's idea. Basically, when he arrived at the scene, he said, look, what we need to do is we need to obfuscate, like change this symbol. That way, if there's somebody else reported seeing this with the same symbol, the fake one, we could quickly identify it as a hoaxer. So it was a good idea. But, you know, Ray Stanford got to the scene. He talked to all, you know, Lonnie Zamora and the family and, and, and Dr. Hynek. And he has been saying for years in his book that, uh, you know, it's not the correct symbol. But everyone was like, oh, well, even Lonnie wrote it out on a piece of paper, which we have. And I actually held that piece of paper in my hand. I got it at the National Archives, not a photocopy of the original. And Lonnie did write that other fake symbol. He did do that. But he did it at the direction of Richard T. Holder. And I've had that confirmed from Richard T. Holder's kids. I had mm -hmm. it confirmed from Mary Zamora, his wife. I had it confirmed from people in town. I mean, it was absolutely what happened. And on top of that, I went to the National Archives with Ray Stanford, and we found a document, which we have in our possession. We've, we uh, photocopied it or scanned it uh, in Dr. Hynek's own handwriting that shows the real symbol. And he doesn't just talk about it he actually writes the symbol in his letter in his own handwriting so we have 100 confirmation of the real symbol 
ironically, we didn't we didn't put that document in the film. Oh. It was in, it was out, it was in, it was out, but mm -hmm. we did put the correct symbol on the side of the craft for the recreation. So well, you may have, may not have answered the KGRA chat room question from Neutron, which is, James, is there something of your film that sadly was cut on the floor that you would now like to pursue further? Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? <laughs> there was so much stuff. We called it killing our darlings. Uh -oh. It was the most painful process ever. I mean, we edited the film in segments. I work on Australia. I work on Rua. I work on Socorro. I work on... Virginia, which is the Roswell of Brazil, um, and then some of the history. And your comment earlier where you said, excuse me, you read in chat rooms where people go, oh, some of the you know rehash of the same history. Yeah, but you have to understand what our objective was with this film. We really were trying to penetrate a much broader audience to, to, to go into a mainstream audience. And quite honestly, they're not going to have much more information on this topic other than maybe Area 51 and Roswell. I mean, they're just simply not going to have that historical perspective. So I had to, I had to cover that history and I couldn't change the history. I mean, the history is the history, but we went to great lengths. I, and I mean, great lengths. Uh, people can't imagine the lengths we went to to uncover never before seen archival interviews and newsreel footage and audio mm -hmm. interviews. I mean, look, some of the best historical ufologists have called me up and went, where did you find the interview with Al Chop? Where did you find the interview with, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, I'll think of the name in a second, Will William Nash, Na the Nash and Fortenberry 1952 sighting of the commercial airline pilots. Nobody's ever seen an interview with William Nash. So we went to great lengths to, to uncover uh, and, and feature new historical archive material. But, but again, hi history is the history. So yeah, history, history is the history of, of all of the, Can't change that. the, <laughs> yeah, of all of the events that you covered. Um, we spoke about this a little bit earlier. You know, I think that the the fact that in Australia, the 1966 event, um, what was the name of that? I can't remember the name of the school. I think it begins with the Westall. W. Westall. Westall. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Westall School. Those children are now adults, and they're they're reconfirming that story. Uh, then you have Zimbabwe, um, and that that I think is the most fascinating because these children, their descriptions of it, they. I think I think this is something I'd like to get your perspective on. So you have all these children in 1994 um, in Ruba, Zimbabwe, at the aerial school. A craft comes and lands, and a being or beings comes out and dressed in all black. Now it seems to me the eyewitnesses, those children, all describe the same general being, right? Big eyes, um, all black. And one of the witnesses said they're about one meter away. But when they were describing seeing the craft, plural, I think there was there were several craft, they were seeing different colors. One is maroon, one was um, green, red, and yellow, one was silver. So as a, I don't know if you like the term ufologist, but as a researcher, how do you make of eyewitnesses seeing different um, descriptions of the same event? Well, they, the children, the colors were lights on the craft. The, that's, those were the colors. The craft itself was um, silver. silver. They all described a silver object. They didn't, in fact, they, don't, I, they never, I don't think any of them said flying saucer. I think they described it as a silver object. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it did have lights. It had red, green, and blue, I think, lights somewhere, either on the bottom or the top or around it. So some of the kids see the lights. But, you know, everyone was in a different place in the playground. There was roughly 100 children out there at the time. Mm -hmm. 66 went on camera for Dr. John Mack and um, that BBC correspondent, Tim Leach, I believe it was. Yeah. Um, but, and, you know, some said they, they thought they saw some hair, but they all, every single one of them described those massive big black eyes and that mm -hmm. they were diminutive. I mean, the, the beans were small with big heads, mm -hmm. big eyes, and small bodies. That was like a hundred percent uniform across the across the board. Um, some of them had telepathic communication; others did not. Um, but apparently, proximity to the beings and then mm -hmm. eye contact is when the is when the telepathy occurred.
Now, how did you get together to meet with these kids as adults? How did, how did that come about? So it was funny, actually, because I remember the first time I heard about this case, and it was in the 90s when I was producing 50 Years of Denial, was the documentary we were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. And I was just naive enough at the time to think I could get an interview with Steven Spielberg. I, we had a mutual friend in common. Mm-hmm. It was a friend of my dad's, this woman, Janet Yang. And uh, she got back to me after a couple of weeks. She's like, yeah, so uh, and it was 1997 at the time. Yeah, yeah so um, Spielberg is definitely not going to meet with you, but <laughs> I want you to know that there's a landing case that occurred in Africa at a school that you, you should really look into. Hmm. And I was like, oh, yeah, right, and pigs fly. Like, I mean, I dismissed it so fast that I don't think it was in my brain for more than five seconds. And I never thought about it again because I just, I said to myself, there's no way that an event of that magnitude could take place in the whole world not know about it. You can't have a landing in broad daylight at a school with a hundred witnesses and the whole world, as far as I was concerned. So I just dismissed it. So when I was trying to put that, you know, fast forward when I was producing this film, I had this, I had this financial guy and I went through a number of financial people, my God. Uh, but this one guy in particular, I'll just give you his first name is Larry. And he was going, you want me to pay to fly all these people in from different corners of the world for a UFO? The land that is, are you out of your mind? I said, Larry, I know I felt the same way, but I'm telling you, look at the testimony yeah. of these children. You know, and we're looking at the, do- the Dr. John Matt. I was just begging him to just look at the testimony, the on camera testimony of the children that John Mack, the Harvard psychiatrist was interviewing within a week or two after the event. And, uh, and I eventually got him to like kind of warm up to the idea. I'm like, please just like suspend judgment. And I get it. I, I understand your knee jerk reaction. I had the same. So mm-hmm. I, I'm not, you know, but just look at this, this testimony. So anyway, I got him on board and the gentleman who's been working on a film for, uh, I think well over a decade, uh, Randall Nickerson, and uh, sort of teamed up with him and licensed some footage from the John Mack Institute. Okay. Um, I think we licensed five or ten minutes of the archival stuff, and uh, and worked with uh, Randall and um, uh, to locate the, the witnesses who he was in touch with, and then bl- bring them in from all different corners of the world, and for the first time actually in twenty years, and 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 we filmed them in a specific location, and then Randall did some additional filming at a different location for his own movie. So that's how Did it take much convincing or were they on board right from the... It was was a nightmare. Oh. Yeah, it was a nightmare. Yeah, it was a nightmare because, you know, just even if they all wanted to come willingly, trying to coordinate and getting time off work and, you know, Mm -hmm. whether married with kids and school teachers and lawyers and, and, um, and we found out that, you know, the, the great bulk of them, didn't even share it with their partners. This one woman, oh, she'll remain nameless, but she, mm-hmm. she said, I haven't even told my husband. I said, what do you mean you didn't tell your husband? How could you not tell your husband? She mm-hmm. said, I was tired of defending myself. But you know, uh, James, I it doesn't necessarily have to be a strange paranormal experience. I mean, as human beings, psychologically, a lot of us do that. I know that from personal experience. You know, people who have um, <clears throat> traumatic and I, I would categorize that as traumatic experience. Um, you had the media coming down on them and had this strange event. Um, but anyone having any kind of traumatic experience, they don't often share that with their partners because there's there's this certain amount of shame or guilt that's um, either you know was assumed upon them by themselves or you know was placed on them by someone else or by society and perception. So that that's not strange to me at all, um, even if it's a, a fantastical event that one from the outside would say, wow, how amazing. Um, how could you not share that? I can understand that it is an emotional experience. And when you're watching, and this is why I encourage everybody to, to see the film, when you're watching the interviews with these children, the depth of sincerity in their eyes, um, it's, it's almost unnerving. Um, as you know, my wife and I were watching it, it was eerie. It mm. was eerie um, because you you know when kids um, have fabricated something, you know. And um, let's say a bunch of kids get together and say, "Hey, let's make up a story," and then you're you know getting all these different interviews of these kids. You can tell um, whether they're they're telling a fantasy or indeed something that 
happen to them. And that's what hit me. That gave me that goose bump, gump bump uh, moment in the film. Uh, you know, and there was, yeah, go ahead. Well, this is funny, actually, because you'd mentioned your wife. And, you know, my partner, Rebecca, and we have a kid together, uh, my son, Ollie, uh, who just turned six a couple months ago. And um, we don't talk UFOs, even though, like, you know, a lot of it consumes my life and a lot of my time. And mm -hmm. we, we don't talk UFOs ever, I don't think, in the household, ever. My, well, my son, a little bit. But um, I was in the edit room probably five or six years ago, just after the time where I was bringing a lot of the witnesses together modern day. And I was reviewing the archival, uh, very tedious um, project, but I was going through the, all the archival interviews with John Mack and the children in Africa. And Rebecca came into the room and, and uh, she like, Oh, what are you doing? And I was like, Oh, I'm looking through, you know, and kind of playing some of the video. And she like, dropped off a cup of tea and she stopped and she looked at the children on camera describing this, this event, this incredible event. And she just froze in her tracks and she went, Oh my God, this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life. Like those kids aren't lying. Like, and I ask your audience and I'm sure, you know, your, your audience is probably well versed in this topic, but if you think about it, you know, if you go to the average citizen, like the average Joe, and say, hey, do me a favor and uh, suspend judgment for a moment and just imagine hypothetically uh, in an alternate reality or whatever that, uh, you know, a flying saucer uh, landed in broad daylight uh, at a school in Africa and the beans got out and interacted telepathically with, with some of the students in broad daylight again for roughly 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, how significant of a story would you give that? People go, well, oh, my God. Well, I mean, if it happened, I mean, if that happened, I don't think there's anything more extraordinary ever. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that'd be the biggest story ever. <laughs> well, you know, obviously I'm convinced it happened. And, uh, and I think, surprisingly, the vast majority, in fact, everyone who's seen the movie has, no matter what, how they felt going into it, was, was convinced that something truly inexplicable uh, potentially otherworldly took place that day in Africa. Hey James, can we squeeze a little more time out of you tonight? I can't hear you very well. Your mic dropped. Can can we squeeze a little more time out of you tonight? Sure. Yeah. All right. So we're gonna keep James on for how about nine forty five? Does that sound good? Uh yeah, that's fine. Okay. I put you on I put you on the spot anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you can certainly say no, that's per perfectly fine. Uh, originally James tonight was supposed to be with us from eight to nine. Um and then obviously we had the technical difficulties and, uh, you know, I, for one, James, am, am just excited that you're on here, that we're having this conversation. I, I really appreciate your work. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of doubt about what you do, about what I do. Do you ever doubt yourself? Do you ever just stop and go, am I going to do another one of these or, you know, or should I be doing something else? Should I just give up on this whole thing? Uh, well, I've learned because I've actually done four and a half films because I've never been satisfied. Like when I first set out in the 90s to do a documentary on the topic, I was like, I'm going to produce the seminal, you know, feature length documentary on the topic of UFOs. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> but but and I, I've done moderately well considering in terms of like, you know, how it materialized into, you know, what it, what it is. Um but never fully satisfied. Like I, I get to the end of a project. I'll give you an example with out of the blue. I finished it. And I remember we were five years in, actually we were four years in, we had a screening of about 200 people and I could tell in the middle of the screen, I could see people tying their shoelaces, looking at their watches, getting up, going to the bathroom. I'm like, ah, oh, this isn't working. So I go back to the drawing board. I spent another year on it, maybe a year and a half. My, my editing online editing partner, Boris co-producer, is in a fetal position. I'm pushing them so hard. He's literally in a fetal position crying. And his wife is like screaming at me, you're killing my husband. And, you know, this has got to stop. You know, this has got to end. I'm not kidding. It really that dramatic. And so the film, I, it was, I had to be done. So the film went out. We sold it to NBC Universal, broadcast on sci-fi. But in the back of my mind, I was like, oh, that film is not done. I could have made it so much better. 
And I got a letter about three years later from NBC Universal indicating they were not going to renew the broadcast option, which I knew anyway. Mm -hmm. And I opted to revisit the film and open it up. And I spent two more years on it. And I remember my two other partners were like, you lost your mind. And I, I'm like, well, you know, come on, you guys. It's, it's never, it wasn't the film that we set out. You know, they're like, no. So I had to get new partners and I spent another two years on it. Yeah. And then that wasn't, it still was much better. I mean, the second version of Out of the Blue is a lot better. Mm -hmm. But eh. But then I did, um, I know what I saw. And yep. I don't know, some people like Out of the Blue better. I personally like I know what I saw better. But hey, you know, uh, that's up for debate. And I think I did moderately well there. But I, again, I wasn't satisfied. And I remember my dad, at, at this point, when I finished I Know What I Saw, I sold it to History Channel, A&E, um, I was disappointed because I almost made a sale to um, Lionsgate. And Lionsgate would have had this global footprint. It would have been an amazing distribution platform. On top of the fact, I would have made a bunch of money. Um, but this is not what propels me to do what I do, obviously. Uh, I'd be shooting uh, commercials if that was the case. But um, uh, I, in the back of my mind, I was like, well, it fell short of the sale with Lionsgate because the production qualities and the narrative wasn't quite as up to par and that sort of thing. Uh, and I remember almost kind of arguing with the guy about it. And I was like, you know, this is a gritty do-it-yourself film. And he's like, yeah, but our audience expects more. You know, anyway, I lost that sale. We went to history. I was disappointed. My dad was like, son, what's going on? Why are you depressed? I was like, I just sold this film for half a million dollars, which sounds like a lot of money, but I was really in debt at the time, uh, to A&E, and I maintained home video distribution rights and that sort of thing, but I was depressed, and my dad was like, what do you, you know, and I told him, I was like, well, I set my sights, to, you know, to accomplish this, and and uh, he said, yeah, but, you know, son, look at what you did. To do. Look at what you did do. You should be proud. You know, I'm proud. And, and, but in the back of my mind, I wasn't, I, I wasn't satisfied. And so when I embarked on this nearly eight-year journey with the phenomenon, uh, I said, I'm learning from my previous mistakes, and I'm not going to make those again. And I'm going to wait until I have someone that I can partner up with and a good way. I went through, like, many writers. Um, uh, hired a National Geographic photographer, professional sound guys, lighting guys, you know, strong narrative and really good cases. And, uh, hey, man, I was like, okay, I think this time we did it. <laughs> no, it's, it's a, you did. It's a solid doc, to be, to be sure. Only took me 26 years. <laughs> but that's the way it is. I mean, I think we can all relate to, or at least you and I can relate to George Lucas to some degree, right? He went back and he like kept tweaking with his original films oh. and people are getting upset at him. And, but you know, that's when you create something, it's still living in you, you know, and you're constantly thinking, you know, Oh, I should have done that. Oh, what if I did that? Um, but eventually you have to just let go. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, you usually run out of money is what usually happens. And I, <laughs> I, I've run yeah. out of money with every film I've ever done. I mean, getting this one across the finishing line, I had to borrow money for the sound mix because it wasn't that my investors didn't have more money to give me. It was like, I'd asked them 10 times for more money. And then the last time I asked them, they were like, well, you told me last time that I'm like, yeah, well, I didn't expect, you know, cause a lot of developments happened during the, the production of this film. I mean, we, we were four and a half years in when the front page of the New York times happened with that secret UFO Pentagon program, a tip. Well, that I had to, I mean, I had to, I, I had to cover that. Yeah. That took two more years. I mean, anyway, um, but yes, at some point you have to say, all right, this film is done. You're out of patience. You know, look, my son was even saying to me, daddy, cause that's all he's known is daddy working on this film. And, um, yeah. he's like, daddy, daddy, are you ever going to produce this movie? <laughs> <laughs> so even he knows <laughs> it, had to, it had to come out. It had to come yeah. out. And then of course, COVID hit. We were right. going to be in theaters yeah. all across America. Oh, well. Yes, but you know what? There are a lot of people at home looking for, for things to watch. That's true. Right? So, and as, in regard to your previous comment, too, about reaching a wider audience, is there any way um, to, to know if you're hitting that target audience? Because I know you can look at analytics, but how do you know if you're getting the new viewer? Well, the cool thing about this project is, is that because we didn't do um, like we almost released it on Netflix. 
um, which would have been great. It would have been a Netflix original. It would have had a massive impact initially, but it would have been a short, it would have been a short lifespan. But because we own the film outright, we are going to roll this film out. This is like a marathon run for us. So we're going to roll this out. We're going to do a series of publicities starting again um, next week. There's going to be some very big things you'll you'll be seeing in December. Trust me. And oh, very uh, cool. All right. Yeah, uh, I, I can assure your audience will not be disappointed. I, I'm yes. certainly very excited. Well, hey, man, we could we could use anything exciting, positive this year for sure. Yeah. yeah so that's happening in December. Yeah. You, you, you'll you'll know about it when it happens. Trust okay. me. And then uh, next year, uh, we'll be doing big streaming platforms. We'll be doing television broadcast platforms, uh, cables channels. Because there's a dearth of fresh content, people are much more willing to share now. So we have TVOD, which is transactional downloads, which is happening. But then there's going to be television broadcast, cable chasings, and then there's going to be streaming. And then there's Hulu. There's all these other platforms. So it's going to make – it's going to penetrate on a much – it's just going to take a little longer. But it's going to – we're in this for the long haul. Gotcha. And it's funny. Someone in the comments just asked any news about the announcement coming. <laughs> um, so uh, – yeah, okay. sorry, yeah, there's a couple really good things happening and, uh, you, you know, and it's happening soon. Uh, I'm, I'm told, and I wouldn't even say a word about it if, if I didn't trust the source. Uh, but the source is, is as good a source as you can get. And I'll leave it at that. But December is going to be a good month. You know, in the film, Jack Valet, uh, he goes to the Stanford School of Medicine and he, you know, you show him bringing a piece of metal and, and it's tested there. Um, and I'm wondering, because it's not really discussed, we, we know that he has multiple um, samples that are apparently from recovered craft or, you know, leftover pieces of, of something. Um, what What is that that he's actually bringing to get tested? Well, do, we, do we know where that's from? Is there any provenance? Yeah, so there's a there. You know, um, it's a lab in Silicon Valley, and it's uh, Gary Nolan, who's a microbiologist at Stanford University. And the machine uh, is this revolutionary device that looks at things at an atomic level. Mm -hmm. um, and Jacques has been collecting material for decades. I mean, he's traveled around the world, and we we mm -hmm. talk about that in the film. And we we go into more specifics. We initially had gone into more specific specifics. One of your uh, uh, comments uh, from one of your audience earlier said, hey, is there anything that ended up on the edit room floor? Lots of stuff that ended up on the edit room floor, one of which was a far more detailed account of their work in that in that lab. Uh -huh. And uh, I think Stanford and, and Gary Nolan were a little nervous on pushing the envelope too much prior to um, – you know, comfort going beyond the comfort zone of Stanford, his association with Stanford, Stanford University, mm -hmm. and especially the, the fact that there have not been uh, peer review and, and publication in a, in, a, in a scientific journal. And so yeah. they were more conservative on that. But Jacques has been uh, traveling the world. I mean, it's incredible, actually. It's like I would be researching cases in uh, South America and, you know, oh, Jacques was down here 15 years ago. I was in uh, uh, Russia, you know, oh, Jacques was, you know, all through this, it's like, geez, this guy gets around. <laughs> He's been everywhere, yeah. well, you know, well, decades before, you know, and, and you know, in, in some of these cases, he's collected uh, material um, from, again, all around the world. So he's been having that stuff analyzed and stuff also has been sent in. So, uh, and, you know, Jacques got a top secret clearance. I, I don't know what you know, other access he's got yeah, I mean, that he doesn't talk about. But I can assure you, yeah. Jacques is very well connected. <laughs> oh, oh, surely. It seems to me in recent years, maybe just perception, that he's kind of come out a little bit more and is spending more more time in the public, um, you know, doing uh, media projects like yours. And, and is there, have you spoken to him? Is there a reason for that, do you think? Well, you know, getting Jacques on board, and I have Lee Spiegel to, to, to thank for that, uh, that took... That that was not easy. I mean, Jacques is very reserved and very right. uh, reluctant to get involved with anyone uh, for anything. And uh, I, I, you know, I think it was after a year or so of 
back and forth with Jacques and we got him out to the studio and he started seeing all this incredible archive material included the 1978 United Nations event that he did with, with, uh, with Lee Spiegel and Jacques and uh, sorry, and um, Dr. Jalen Hynek and, and Sergeant Coyne and uh, all that. We uncovered that footage for the first time in history. I mean, Lee Spiegel who put the event on had never seen that footage. Um, he saw that I went into great depth of Socorro, New Mexico, which was very close to his heart. He was, mm -hmm. he was uh, meeting with Dr. Heineck at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio in Amazing. April of 1964, talking about these close encounter cases in, in, in France. There was a wave in the 50s, and he was telling Heineck about, you know, look, you got to look at these, psycho these cases that are dismissed as psychological because those are close encounters that involve beings. And then that happened. And he saw that I'd spent like five years looking into the case, interviewed the family, blah, blah, blah. And I think he eventually came around and figured he had an obligation to make sure that we put the pieces of the puzzle together accurately. And um, so uh, he was really hard to get on board. I mean, initially it was like, oh, well, I'll talk about this one little thing and that's it. And then, you know, m more and more as time went on and he came out to the studio and I'd have to pinch myself when he was out in the studio with us. I like, can't believe that I'm working with Jacques Vallée. Like, how, how did this happen? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a whole level of caliber up here. Yeah. Oh my gosh! And he's so nitpicky too, because he'd go, he would go through sections. I'm sorry, I'm getting sidetracked here, but yeah. he would go through the, you know, he'd come into the studio and he'd look at the cut of Socorro and he'd be like, ah, throw all that other garbage out. <laughs> yeah, this book is right here. But you that, know? That's very helpful to you. I mean, that, that's extraordinarily helpful. valuable. Sure. But, oh my God, are you kidding me? But it was a pain in the ass too, because you know, when you're an editor and you've looked at something for a thousand hours, you just want to get it done, you know? But then, and you get attached, you get attached. You yeah. get attached and someone tells you it's like to rip it all apart and just discard what took a year, a year to get. Like mm -hmm. I interviewed his coworkers, I interviewed all these people. He's like, those guys weren't firsthand eyewitnesses. What are you doing having them? Who cares what they think? You know, who cares what they heard? I want to hear from him directly. So anyway, mm -hmm. it was very helpful having Jacques in, in the studio and and uh, seeing his involvement. But you you asked like why he's getting more involved with other projects. I mean, he's not getting any younger. So he's probably thinking this is a good opportunity. Uh, you know, working with us, he's got, ultimate control on, on on how the content is 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 um is presented sure. uh, that's that's mm -hmm. that's pretty rare that you get control on you know accuracy and factual yeah. presentations i mean most production companies don't allow that but that was that's how I operate. So, yeah, but, I mean, that's clout. So we've got a question uh, from John Ostanis. Uh, Does Mr. Fox believe in the existence of the Hollow Man Air Force Base UFO landing footage, which was promised by the milita military to Emmenager and LMH? If so, does he think we'll ever see it? That's a brilliant question. And I came across, uh, your eyes would glaze over if I gave you all the details. It doesn't matter. But I did come across that story when I was investigating the coral because Holloman's just a stone's throw by the crow flies from Socorro. And that incident, that alleged landing incident that was filmed, occurred right around the same time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was 65 or 64 or 63, but it's right around that same time. And I found this out because Corral Lorenzen, I think it was called the UFO Bulletin. I'd have to look back at that one. But Corral Lorenzen had written a couple of articles about it. And she had interviewed, which I read, she had interviewed people that actually worked at the base mm -hmm. that talked about that landing case. And look, if you're going to believe that there was a close encounter of the third kind that occurred in Socorro, New Mexico in April of 1964, then why the hell would you not believe that a landing case happened just a few miles down the road? I don't know, 50 miles, 100 miles, whatever it is. It's not mm -hmm. far. Um, that just happened to get captured on film. So it's not that big of a leap. To, to assume that happened. But I met with Alan, there was Alan Sandler and Bob Ebenegger that produced the film UFOs, Past, Present, or Future. Okay. I interviewed both of them. In fact, I sat Ebenegger down for a two hour interview all about that. Then I went to, to the East Coast in Florida and mm -hmm. I met with Colonel William T. Coleman. And William T. Coleman was a public yes. spoke officer for Project Blue Book, mm -hmm. later became uh, uh, public, uh, public relations for the Pentagon. He's the one that gave uh, access 
to to both of those guys, Emin Ager and Alan Sandler, in the 70s doing their production of their film. And I pinned those bastards down hard about that footage. Yeah. And, and Emin Ager was absolutely convinced that Paul Shartle, who was, uh, worked at Norton Air Force Base, I believe it was, yeah. had that footage. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to give you guys the shortest version possible. Um, Emin Ager was convinced it was there. Emin Ager was convinced that they were going to get their hands on it. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Shartle uh, and Emin Ager spent a lot of time together. According to Alan Sandler, Paul Shartle, it was at Norton Air Force Base in California, I believe it was, showed the footage to Alan Sandler. Mm -hmm. So Alan Sandler actually saw it. And when I was talking to Alan and he let that cat out of the bag, I was like, wait a minute, what did you just say? Did, are you saying you, you saw the Vandenberg thing or are you – you actually saw the landing at Holloman with the saucer and the beans get out. He goes, yeah, I saw it. He showed it to me. And so I was like, okay, well, tell me what you saw. Yeah. And I don't know if you guys want me to take up the time and and hear this. Well, it's, it's your call. Oh, well, if you guys want to hear it, I'll give it to you. Let's go for it. Yeah, all right. So what I do when I want to really um, – uh, capture someone's story vividly i close my eyes so i allow their words to recreate the visuals for me so i uh -huh. see it i don't I hear it i see it so it's a technique i've been doing for a long time i did it with uh, with edgar mitchell when when he told me about going to the moon and landing on the moon i closed my eyes for 30 minutes and i recreated the whole thing in my head i know exactly every little aspect of going to the moon from sure. Edgar Mitchell's mouth, six men to walk on the moon. And I did the same thing with Alan Sandler. When he told me I was driving, I know exactly where I was driving, what I was doing. And I went, I'm sorry, wait, hang on, back up. Wait, what? You saw you saw the footage? Oh, yeah, Paul Charles shared it to me. Why didn't you share it with, with Eminager? Well, Eminager wasn't there that day. Okay. I pulled the car over to the side of the road, and I closed my eyes. I had the thing on speaker, and I said, give it to me. And here's what he said. He said, well, uh, the footage is color. I believe he said it was color. I'm almost positive he said it was color. And there were three discs that were coming in way off in the distance on camera. And they were escorted by military jets. This is what he told me. I'm not saying that I believe this or don't believe it. This is mm -hmm. what he told me. He said, on the film footage, you have three saucers that fly, are flying in, they're getting closer and closer and closer to the camera. They were off in the distance and they're escorted by military jets and they get over the base. Two of the discs peel away and one, like a leaf, wobbles down to the ground. And he said it was like, almost like it was in trouble. That's what it looked like, but it kind of wobbled as it came down. And then he said, just like in a sci-fi movie, a seamless door opens. And out comes some stairs. He goes, I don't even know where the seams were. The door opened. That's mm -hmm. what he described. And he said, uh, open up some stairs. And that two uh, beans with tight-fitting suits on um, got out, walked, and, and then and – then, uh, stood on either side of the staircase and then a third one came down and he had a very large nose a s tiny little mouth big eyes with, with vertical slits so i'm just again i'm just telling you what he told me mm -hmm. hair regalia like a big hair thing mm -hmm. and then a, some sort of device that he assumed was a, was 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 a uh translator of sorts and that the 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 main guy steps off and he meets with some base people the base and they all got into a jeep uh, a little convoy and then they drove off and then and he's and i said well what happened to the disc and he said we well, just sat there and then the film footage ended and he was convinced alan that it was some sort of hollywood stunt special effects thing where they were creating uh you know but here's what i found out word got out that paul Shartle had shown that footage to alan that's when they put the kibosh down they were both debriefed. Alan never told Emmenager since 1972 or 74, whenever he was showing that footage, ever. Mm -hmm. For 50 years, he didn't tell him 
almost 50 years. And uh, that came out when I was interviewing both of them. And Emanator is absolutely convinced it was otherworldly, according to Paul Shardle, as Paul Shardle, who had the footage, was also convinced it was otherworldly. It was not a staged event. It was not a special effect. Alan Sandler was convinced that it was a flying saucer, one of our own. Colonel Coleman said we did not have that technology. We do not have that today. We certainly didn't have it then. So you can just make up your own mind as to what you think. But I'm absolutely convinced that, that film footage exists. Well, I know it exists. Uh, I don't know where it is. I certainly would love to find out. Alan had even said to me that he would help me find it, that if you know where to look. Um, uh, yeah, so that's that's that story in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's what it's all about, right? I mean, that's it's all about... It just reminds me of the X-Files, right? You just, you're so close, and mm. then it just slips away, and you're left to question. Mm. Um and and yeah, I mean anything hearsay, you you, you have to. It, but it wasn't be... exactly hearsay. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I actually spoke with the guy and went to his house who saw it. I, I wouldn't necessarily call that hearsay. Would sure, you? sure. Yeah, and then I have an interview with Paul Shardle on camera. Where he talks about the footage, and then I had then I interviewed for two hours Paul uh, Bob Emenager, and then I interviewed Colonel William T. Coleman, who was in charge of getting access during the production of UFOs past, present, and future to all these different military installations. Yeah. So I wouldn't call it hearsay. Is it concrete? No, but it's more than hearsay. Don't you think? It's enough, I think, to warrant investigation. I mean, if, if you were presenting a case to a court, um, it, you could start with a, an eyewitness that may yeah. not seal the deal, yeah. but, but it's, a, it's admit, admissible mm. um, as evidence. So yeah, a absolutely. Now, yeah. Uh, but the, it, 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 say one more thing. Sure. If you watch the movie UFOs, UFOs Past, Present, or Future, and I think it had a couple of different titles, but mm -hmm. they say in the in the film, and all of the recreations were done from that film footage, the description of everything, they say that um, uh, we're about to present you an, 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 an event that might happen or might already have happened. It's interesting the way they word it. And during the production of that film, they had unprecedented access and cooperation with the military. Mm -hmm. And every single word, according to both Alan and Bob, was carefully selected. That mm -hmm. was not just random, write it down on the paper and lay the narration. No, every word was carefully selected. So when they present that case, they say an event that may happen or may already have happened, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. That is, it's enigmatic. Um, yeah. It, which tells me that there is uh, a motive behind doing that and saying that um, a little bit of just confusion, obfuscation, you know, and um, I, I have to ask you this. Now, I, I think, I think that we, the people, including our representatives in government are going to be the disclosure. I don't think any factions behind the scenes are going to be pulling levers and deciding disclosure. My sense is that as new generations come up, there's a different mindset and they want the answers, whether they work for government, military, and what have you. What do you think? I think that, and I'm not just saying this because I produced the film or directed the film, there's a lot of other people that are involved, but uh, this is about as close to disclosure as I've personally seen, and I've done four films on the topic. So the level of cooperation with people, um, the willingness to publicly endorse a film that deals with close with 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 close encounters of the third kind i've never seen that before mm -hmm. um the participation again not just the participation but the willingness to publicly endorse christopher mellon endorsing it harry reed endorsing it lou elizondo yeah. the director of the program at atip tweeted about the movie and said everything in this film is true it says things that i was unable to say um so i'm you know, would I like this to be the tipping point? Of course I would. Uh, do I think we're moving in the right direction? I absolutely do. And I think that we have to keep the pressure on. And what surprises me is that, you know, these news organizations that have, you know, massive budgets, think yeah. about what they could do if they just did more than scratch the surface. I mean, they, they report on the secret UFO Pentagon program. Then you got the people that started it saying 
there's a mountain of evidence it hasn't seen the light of day. You know, and then why aren't they picking up and running with this more than, than they have? Why does it take independent people like myself and you, you know, George Knapp and, and a handful of others to uh, uh, to be doing this? I mean, that should be they should be doing more. Right. I, I mean, we're, we're, we're filling in for the dissemination that, that yeah. the mainstream media should be doing. Yes. Yes. And, and, you know, and look, you talk to them and say, oh, well, if this were true, it'd be the biggest story of mankind, you know. And, and then they go, yeah, a lot of people don't feel like we're alone in the universe. It's like, you know, that we might not be alone. It's like, uh, we're actually talking about stuff that's happening right here in this within our atmosphere. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Like it's happening here and now. That, that was one of the things that, that Christopher Mellon, former deputy uh, assistant secretary of defense for intelligence, said in the movie, which I thought was kind of funny. He was like, He's like, yeah, the New York Times story was great, and that, that changed everything, but they kind of mm -hmm. missed the bigger part. And I was like, what, what do you mean? He goes, well, yeah, they revealed this secret Pentagon program, and that's great. But the bigger story was these things are here. This is happening now. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote that down in my notes. You know, this is this is real. Yeah. <laughs> like what? Okay, let's. we can talk about a program and how the program got started, how you know it became public, but what about – the focus of the program itself. Um, but I do think that it, we've gotten a little bit more coverage in that regard. Um, you do have the the Pentagon ad admitting that these videos are real, that these are UAPs. Um, but James, thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight. Um, we both had some technical difficulties, but we made it through. Um, so I really appreciate you. Real question. Real, real, yeah. I'll mention this quickly. If you guys, if anyone wants to purchase the film instead, as opposed to rent it, you got to do it from iTunes or Vimeo because it comes with three hours of bonus material for no extra cost. And people don't know that. So if you're going to spend the $12.99 to buy it, then get it from iTunes or Vimeo. And please take a moment to rate it. It's really helpful for us. All right, James, thank you once again. And everyone, please go out there and check out the phenomena. It's been a great conversation. Thank you, everyone in the chat room. I appreciate your input as well. Um, and as always, I have to thank our producer, Bill Skywatcher, for making this happen tonight and, uh, you know, taking the technical reins where I had uh, <laughs> I had uh, dropped the ball, I think. And uh, of course, I want to thank our special, special, <sighs> special holiday stream tonight. Um, we were actually not going to have a show tonight. Um, this was the only KGRA show. And um, and it's all because of Bill Skywatcher. So Bill, I just, again, I just want to thank you so much for putting in the time, effort, and energy to make this program happen every week on KGRA Radio. And of course, I want to thank our KGRA Head of Operations, Eric Brager. If you want to find out more about upcoming shows, you can follow me on Twitter at Paranormal underscore now, or on Instagram at Paranormal, <clears throat> Paranormal Now, and on Facebook.com slash Paranormal Now Radio. Everyone, once again, thank you. Happy holidays. Be safe. Take care of each other. And until next time, live in the mystery. <laughs>